At a time when Europeans were praying to the bones of their saints to cure their illnesses, Muslim physicians developed an innovative theory that disease was transmitted through tiny airborne organisms, the precursor to the study of germs. They determined that sick patients should be quarantined and then treated. This is the basis of the institution most fundamental to medicine today, the hospital. Funded mainly through religious endowments, Muslim hospitals had separate wards for patients suffering from different kinds of disease. Even mental illness was treated. Their studies of anatomy were so sophisticated that they remained in use by Muslim and European physicians for 600 years. Muslim scientists were especially intrigued by light, lenses, and the physiology of the human eye. The father of optics was a Muslim named Ibn al-Haytham. His work with lenses eventually led to the invention of the modern camera. He produced the first treatise that ventured to explain how the eye actually sees. A thousand years before the West dared to take up the practice, Muslim doctors were removing cataracts surgically, clearing them from the eye with a hollow needle. But for all this knowledge to transform and illuminate an empire, it had to be copied and shared across a hundred different cities in the Islamic world. For this, there was a new invention one that is still fundamental to learning and knowledge today. Paper. Around the year 700, 750, when Muslim armies reached Central Asia, they encountered paper for the first time. And very quickly, the Muslim bureaucracy um, started using paper. You find that, you know, within 50 years it's in Syria, and then a few years after that it's in, it's in Egypt, and then it's in North Africa, and then it's in, in Sicily, and then it's in Spain. And that's where Europe learned to make paper from. They learned to make it from the Arabs. We begin to have people with family names like papermaker. So in other words, it, not only uh, that paper was available, it must have become a very, very uh, widespread industry. And hence, the acquisition of books must have also become very easy. With the wide use of books and paper, hundreds of scribes, some of whom were women, were kept busy transcribing the translations and new writings of the Baghdad scholars. All of this knowledge that's being acquired from the Greeks and from the Indians and from Central Asia and stuff is all being written down in books on paper. And that these books are being copied and recopied and sent around. We know, for example, that there was a street of booksellers um, with more than a hundred shops, each one with paper and books for sale. Um, and this is a time when, you know, in uh, Europe, a monastery would be lucky if it had five or ten books. While the monks of the West were hoarding their wisdom on scraps of expensive parchment, paper enabled Islamic civilization to spread its newfound knowledge far and wide, creating a single community linking three continents. So the chief distinction, therefore, of Islamic civilization uh, in addition to the fact that it made new leaps of originality, new transformations in uh, traditions of learning and, and everything else possible, is the fact that it enabled human beings to consider the possibility of thinking about the globe as a single unit, humanity. In all the broad empire, there was one place the Christian world could experience the lifestyle Muslims now took for granted. Southern Spain.
here, on the European continent itself, Islamic culture would begin to have an effect on the European civilization around it. A thousand years ago, the Spanish city of Cordoba was a center of learning and culture that rivaled Baghdad. Today, Cordoba's narrow lanes hearken to its medieval past. During the Dark Ages, this was the most prosperous and sophisticated metropolis on the continent. It had street lights and paved roads, libraries, hospitals and palaces. This was a city of light, a Muslim city. The city of Cordoba in the 9th and 10th centuries was one of the biggest and most exciting in Europe. We have descriptions of it by people coming and saying, all these flowers everywhere, this, this open streets, this, this wonderful light coming down. Uh, northern cities were dark. Cordoba had running water. People lived in big houses. In contrast, in Paris, people lived in shacks by the side of the river. The glory of medieval Cordoba is here, in what is now the great Roman Catholic Cathedral in the middle of town. But the Cordoba Cathedral of today began its life as a mosque, one of the grandest of the Islamic Empire. The Great Mosque in Cordoba was simply the biggest mosque in the biggest city in southern Europe. When you climb up into the church tower, which used to be a minaret, you look out over this expanse of, of roof, it's quite amazing to see this cathedral, complete with flying buttresses, popping up out of this, the middle of this massive mosque. Many, many people came to visit it to view the wonders of the mosque, which had rib vaulting, the kind of vaulting which is like this, and which 100 years later, by a mere coincidence you might think, but not at all a coincidence, appears in the Gothic cathedrals of Northern Europe, in Lincoln Cathedral, in Chartres Cathedral in France. Where does that come from? Obviously influenced by the great mosque of Cordoba in the south of Spain. For the occasional European Christian traveler, Cordoba was their one opportunity to glimpse the Islamic world. What they saw was shocking. Most of Europe at that time languished in poverty and squalor. Cordoba was a pageant of prosperity and enlightenment. In the um, 10th century there was a Saxon nun with the unpronounceable name of Hrotswitha who called medieval Cordoba the ornament of the world. She was very, very taken with the place. And there you are, she's a Christian nun. As Europeans made their way from the cold stone of their northern castles into the glorious Muslim cities of southern Spain, they couldn't help but be impressed. In the green hills above Granada was a palace of startling elegance a shining example of the richness and sophistication Islam brought to medieval Europe. It is called the Alhambra. The Alhambra is perhaps the most famous example of, of Islamic architecture to, to most Westerners. It is the, the best remaining example of what a medieval Muslim palace would have looked like. Echoed in the finely carved geometric plaster work and marble pillars is a vanished lifestyle of extraordinary luxury.